Okay. I have my, do you want me to share my screen for? You can just go ahead and introduce and I'll start the videos. Okay, great. Um, hi everyone, this is Jenna. Uh, thanks for sticking around for the Harmful Algal Bloom session. Um, our first speaker is going to be from as uh, Peggy Lehman from the California Department of Water Resources. Uh, Peggy has a PhD at UC Davis in ecology and has over 40 years of experience. Go ahead and uh, start, Peggy. Today, I'm going to tell you about harmful cyanobacteria blooms in San Francisco estuary. This is a result of 20 years of field and laboratory research that we've done. These are some of my collaborators. I have to thank them all for their hard work. I also want to thank all the granting agencies for their assistance. Our story began about 1999 when people on the water saw these, these flakes of green. It looked to them like little pieces of lettuce or maybe green corn flakes. And everybody wanted to know what was going on. <clears throat> it turned out that the organism in the water was called microcystis, specifically microcystis aeruginosa. It's a cyanobacterium. It's often toxic. In our system, it was unique because it was just microcystis aeruginosa. Often it occurs with a lot of other species and in many strains. However, within about eight years, we started seeing that develop. So we had multiple species of microcystis as well as multiple strains of microcystis aeruginosa. Today, we have a full cyanobacteria bloom with multiple species of cyanobacteria that are toxic, such as Dilatrophermum and Planktothrix. Plus, we have at least 10 strains of microcystis aeruginosa. Microcystis usually occurs uh, in the, the central and delta and southern delta, but we've tracked it throughout large regions of the estuary. In fact, we saw it all the way down as far as Benicia and Martinez. Uh, we've seen it at salinities of 18 parts per thousand, so uh, it can tolerate salinity, so it has the potential to spread uh, throughout large regions of the estuary. In 2020, it reached hazardous levels, so it is really magnified. Um, State Board reported uh, at levels of about 1,000 micrograms per liter in some areas of the, of the Delta, uh, around Stockton and Discovery Bay, and very high levels around the main stem of San Joaquin River, and near Antioch and further upstream. Well, what makes it toxic? Uh, microcystis contains microcystins. Microcystins are hepatotoxins, and microcystins have many forms. Um, I've seen about 11 to 13 of those. One of them is called microcystin LR, and microcystin LR is considered to be the most toxic of these forms. And pretty much I've always seen um, microcystin LR in our samples. So uh, our blooms are usually toxic at, at one level or another. Uh, lately, though, since 2016, we've seen development uh, in this area where we have more toxins. Uh, we have these neurotoxins called anatoxin A and saxotoxin. They can be particularly difficult uh, for fish. It's difficult to determine the toxicity of microcystis blooms because the toxicity varies so rapidly. So for instance, you might go to Antioch on one day and see that 18% of the bloom was toxic, and a couple of weeks later, you would go and find only 3% was toxic. So with this high variability, we have to sample often. So what factors control the bloom? Nitrogen is really important for microcystis. Unlike a lot of cyanobacteria, it does not produce its own nitrogen. So it must get it from the water column. In our system, we found that it grows fastest on ammonium. However, the nitrogen that we have in the system is primarily nitrate, and it also grows well on that. So to control it, you need to control the total nitrogen in the system. 
Water temperature is probably one of the most defining variables for microcystis because it grows at high temperatures that other species cannot. In our system, during the winter and the spring, microcystis stays down in the bottom muds. And then when temperatures reach about 19 degrees, it comes up to the water column, stays there throughout the summer, and then in the late fall and early winter, uh, when temperatures reach below 15 degrees, it goes back down to the bottom muds and stays there till the next season. Full suspended solids um, appear to be important in the sense that we see more microcystis at about 10 to 20 milligrams per liter of total suspended solids. However, microcystis is very adaptable when it comes to light. It vertically migrates in the water column. And so we can uh, attain whatever light levels it wishes and it's very tolerant of surface irradiances that are high. Of course, we know when it comes to microcystis as an all uh, plankton, uh, it's multiple factors interacting together that influence bloom development. So in this case, for instance, we can look at stream flow and water temperature, and we find that microcystis is highest when we have a combination of high water temperature, about 25 degrees, and slow flow represented here by X2 index of 85. We also suspect that some of the chemicals that are in the water column um, influence the bloom development. And one of the key ones that we know of are herbicides. We tested fluoridone, one of the herbicides that was commonly put in the estuary. And for our microcystis, we found that it grew better when fluoridone was in the water column than the diatom Thalassia syra. And Thalassia syra is, is a good algae, one of the ones that we would like to see in the estuary. So that depression uh, suggests to us that uh, the influence of herbicides uh, may not be positive in the system. Well, how does the bloom affect aquatic organisms? We know that microcystins occur in all animals of, of the estuary, but we feel that it moves through the food web through a dose response kind of effect. For instance, you might have something like uh, this thread thin shad. It for some reason gobbles up microcystis so much so that its tummy becomes distended and it looks green from the side. A fish eating a few of these through the course of the day would get a very high dose of microcystis. As we look through the, the communities, what we find, for instance, for photosynthetic plankton, that wet and dry years seem to be important. So for instance, in dry years, like 2014, we will have a lot of microcystis and other toxics on our bacteria. But in wet years, we will have much less. I wanna point out that we have a lot of cyanobacteria in the estuary, much more than we do the toxic ones. And they aren't bad. So having cyanobacteria in general is not bad. It's just the toxic ones we have to worry about. When it comes to phytoplankton or algae, as we call them, uh, there is a shift during microcystis blooms. We have less diatoms and green algae are often favored plankton. And then when we don't have as many uh, microcystis in the water column, we have more of these uh, diatoms and Cryptophytes seem to occur when we have microcystis, um, so it's, it's, it's one of the more uh, desirable foods. So that's not so bad, um, but uh, it does go down uh, in the wetter years. In terms of zooplankton, zooplankton uh, are definitely influenced by the presence of microcystins in the water as well as microcystis in their food. Um, and it seems to uh, be different for individual species. So for instance, um, immortality increases for both Pseudoreaptus and Uretemera when exposed to microcystis, but Pseudoreaptus is more sensitive. So we can find you know, a split in species composition with the presence of microcystis. Fish uh, have uh, a negative response to the presence of microcystis in their diet, their condition factor goes down. Uh, they may have body abnormalities such as cavitation or curvature of the spine. And in recent studies, we've also found that 
they can be poisoned by microcystis just by swimming in the water. Uh, the colonies go in through their gills, move through the digestive system, and then impact the liver. We now know that when microcystis occurs in the water column, it occurs as a part of an ecosphere. In our system, using metagenomic analysis, we identified three major groups, a plankton group, which include like zooplankton and larvae and mollusks, we have a bacteria group, which was quite diverse, and then a cyanobacteria group. Within the cyanobacteria group, we had things like planktothrix, Pseudoanabena, microcystis, et cetera. We had a few green algae like Bulldogs and Chlamydomonas. We had some tiny zooplankton, the Barra, Cyclopena, and Limnothona. We feel they probably are not affected by microcystis. They may eat little ciliates, and so they're, they're not influenced by the poisons. Um, we also had a few bacteria, and one of the ones that was most interesting was Phenylobacteria. Phenylobacterium eats inorganic substances. Um, so inorganic substance would include, in this case, herbicides. And it could be that this phenylobacterium is indicated that there is some kind of inorganic substance in the water, which is helping to promote the microcystis bloom. So what do we know? We know a lot. We know about the distribution of the bloom. We know about some of its controlling factors. Uh, we know about how it moves through the food web. We know the toxins that it contains. We know some of the genetic composition of the bloom. And we know how it's influenced by climate change. But what we don't know really well is some of the real-time composition and toxin concentrations that occur. And we really don't know how to control this bloom. So what do we do now? In the short term, we need to focus on safety and early warning systems because this bloom is now hazardous. We need to develop in situ real time monitoring programs that measure species composition and toxin concentration. We need to have that information transferred in real time to web systems so people can see what's happening. Perhaps we can develop citizen monitoring programs that use systems like um, your cell phone to identify where blooms are occurring. And we need to develop some forecast modeling programs so in the short term, we can determine where the hazard is gonna be greatest. Over the long term, we need to develop management strategies. And one of the main things we need to do is to control our nutrients. Particularly, we need to control nitrogen and phosphorus. To do this, we're gonna to need to develop a total maximum daily load allocation, which is called a TNEL. This is difficult to do, but Chesapeake Bay has done this. I think we can do it. We need to develop treatment systems so we can handle those areas where we have very high concentrations of microcystis. And then we need to work together to reduce the impacts of climate change because high temperatures and drought are driving this bloom. One of the things we also need to do is to educate, and we need to educate at all levels. It's very well and good for us to tell our colleagues about what's going on, but we need to tell the public so they know what to do. And importantly, we need to educate the young people in our community. They are the movers and shakers of the future. They are the ones that will help to solve this problem. And, and I wanna make a plug here for something we have recently done We've developed a collection of stories uh, on the science of the estuary called Where the River Meets the Ocean, Stories from San Francisco Estuary. We did this in collaboration with the journal Frontiers for Young Minds, provides a lot of information for young people to learn about what the situation is in the estuary. I, I uh, highly recommend if you haven't seen it, take a look. It's, it's a really fun collection. So in summary, we've learned that the cyanobacteria blooms in our estuary affect all aspects of the health, economy, and ecology of the Delta. And what we have to focus on right now is learning how to control this. So thank you, and, and now I'll take questions. Great talk, Peggy. Thanks for a great 
kick off for us in this session. I do. I, I am not seeing any questions right good. now. <laughs> that means everyone understood it. That's good. <laughs> right? <laughs> or it's the end of the day. It's the end of the day. I have to admit it. <laughs> but that was a great introduction for us to get started for this session, kind of understanding what we know, what we don't know, where we're going. Uh, so I really appreciate your expertise and like, kicking us off. That was really great and helpful. Uh, let's see, if you have any questions, please play, uh, put them in the question and answer and not in the chat. Um, still nothing. <laughs> yeah, no, I, Stephanie just mentioned the, uh, the uh, Frontiers for Young Minds uh, collection that we have. Um, I just want to remind everybody that this is a collection of 35 papers that we've done on issues in the estuary. A lot of uh, the people in the estuary have, have been involved in this, and it's a really great collection. Uh, I expect you to really come out within the next two months or so because we, we're almost all done with those 35 papers. And uh, it's a great piece of work. We're going to set it up as an ebook for all of us to look at, so it should be fun to share. But uh, take a look at it. Everybody's done a really nice job on it. Oh, hey, we got a question from Ted Flynn. He asks, what are some of the methods for nonpoint nitrogen phosphorus reduction? Well, there are a lot of best management practices that, that they have out there. And I, I can say this is not my field of expertise, but a lot of the things that they often do is take waters from farm fields for industry and then put them through these wetland systems, right? So that's one way they do it. Um, containing, uh, some of the toxins that run off the field is another way. Reduce the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that added uh, as fertilizers is another way. So there are, there are practices out there that can be done. I think between recycling the nitrogen and trying to reduce the amount of nitrogen uh, put on the system, that, those are the main things that I've heard of people using. Great, and then you have one more question from Tamara Cross and she says, can you talk about HABs and backwater areas like Stockton and Discovery Bay versus the larger channels in the Delta and how would you approach them? Well, in terms of, in terms of management, well, we just at this point are, are seeing these uh, very hazardous concentrations in areas like the Stockton Ship Channel area as well as Discovery Bay. And in those areas, um, they're fairly contained. And I think in those areas, we could use such uh, uh, techniques as, as bubbling. Uh, you know, those, those bubbling techniques are, are good for small areas. And I think we could uh, uh, think about it there. Plus, you know, there are a lot of um, control issues. For instance, I know around the, the city of Stockton in that particular channel, they do have like golf courses and these areas, for instance, have a lot of nitrogen runoff. So, some management could be um, used there. In harbor areas like in Discovery Bay, there's probably a lot of uh, input of, of material uh, as well. It's a huge housing area down there and they probably do use a lot of um, substances that, that would produce nitrogen. So I think it's a matter of the same thing of control and small area management techniques. All right, well, thanks, Peggy. Um, for the interest of time, I'm gonna move on to our next speaker, but there is a question for you from Tanya in the Q&A if you'd like to answer um, okay. on, the side, uh, on the sidelines. Um, all right, we're gonna transition to our next talk by Keith uh, Boma Gregson from the US Geological Survey. Hello, everybody. My name is Keith Boma Gregson, and I'm a biologist at the US Geological Survey, at the California Water Science Center. And I'm one of the newer additions to the biogeochemistry group at the California Water Science Center, having joined last summer. However, you're probably familiar with the work this group has done. They've been involved in many water quality and biogeochemistry research projects in the Delta over the last decade plus. And my background is in algal and cyanobacterial ecology, and I'm excited to be expanding the capacity of the group to study harmful algal blooms and phytoplankton to learn how these organisms are impacting food webs, biogeochemistry, and public health in the, in the Delta. And today I'll be sharing information about the cyanotoxin and cyanobacterial sampling that we've been conducting since 2020. And before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge my other colleagues at USGS who have contributed to these projects, our collaborators at Department of Water Resources, and the entities that have funded these efforts. 
And first, I'll provide some background on cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins, then share data from our research projects. So cyanobacteria are a photosynthetic bacteria, which means they take sunlight and CO2 and turn it into sugars and oxygen. They evolved over 2 billion years ago and have had a major impact on the development of many of Earth's ecosystem ecosystems. And because cyanobacteria have been around for billions of years, they have had plenty of time to evolve to inhabit all sorts of different environments on Earth. They are primarily aquatic and found in fresh and ocean waters. And in many of these environments, cyanobacteria exist as part of a healthy ecosystem, often at low biomass. However, in fresh waters, certain environmental conditions can cause cyanobacteria to bloom and dominate the water column. And one of the reasons this is consequential is because cyanobacteria produce toxins that are um, harmful to humans, pets, livestock, and other animals. Now, um, these cyanotoxins are, um, are very diverse. You can see um, in this figure that there's a lot of different molecular structures uh, for these different types of toxic classes. And so there's dozens of toxic molecules. And if furthermore, um, for each one of these main structures, there's also numerous variants where the molecules are in slightly different positions. And if you start to account for those, then the number of molecules quickly jumps into the hundreds. However, these molecules are generally divided into four toxicological categories that affect the skin, liver, kidneys, or nervous system. And the table here on the slide shows the toxins that are being analyzed uh, as part of our studies. Microcystin is the most well-studied cytotoxin in the delta and really the globe. Uh, however, a lot of um, some of the work that's coming out of Peggy Lehman and Department of Water Resources has also been detecting anatoxins and saxotoxins in the delta too. However, we know much less about these toxins in the delta compared to microcystin. So looking at a few other toxins that are found in other water bodies, but haven't yet been extensively studied in the delta yet. And it's important to recognize that these molecules are quite, quite different from one another. Each class of molecules are synthesized with different genes and are doing quite different things within the cyanobacterial cells. So we can't really generalize uh, across these different types of molecules. So with that short background, I'll now start to talk about some of the work that we've been doing the last couple of years. So the uh, biogeochemistry group, like I mentioned before, is involved in a lot of different projects. Um, a number of these are um, special research projects uh, across a variety of topics. And one of the um, things that unites all these projects are these two core data collection efforts. We have our continuous fixed station network and our boat-based high-resolution mapping. And we think of the fixed station network as a temporally dense data set uh, on each station. We have in situ um, SONs that are collecting data every 15 minutes. We also return to these stations bi-weekly or monthly to collect water quality samples. Um, and so we get a lot of high resolution data over time. However, we don't know that much about what's going on between the sample, between the stations. So that's where the, um, the high resolution mapping comes in. For this, we um, drive the boat around the Delta and pump water um, through a series of sensors as we're driving. And so for this, we're able to collect data every few minutes and um, get this um, map that fills in um, the information between the stations. We also stop at about 30 different sites and collect um, water quality and discrete samples during these campaigns as well. Now, previously we haven't um, had cytotoxins um, added to these efforts, but that began to change in 2020 when we started to get funded to um, collect cytotoxin sampling. And, um, this is beneficial because the cyanotoxin sampling is expensive and you often want to compare the cyanotoxin results with other parameters. And so since we're already collecting nutrients, chlorophyll, dissolved organic um, material at these samples, it made a lot of sense to also add cyanotoxins to the list of analytes that are measured. So currently we are collecting samples at six stations, uh, shown here as the yellow stars. And um, this is all done in collaboration with DWR. Um, the Rough and Ready Island Station and the Vernal Station are actually DWR monitoring stations. So they collect the samples there and then pass them to us, whereas these samples, these stations are USGS stations. The samples um, are collected 18 times per year, uh, monthly during the summertime, or sorry, monthly during the winter, and about bi weekly during the summer. And um, for each sample, they are at each station, we're collecting water samples as well as spat samples. Now, some of you may be wondering what a spat sampler is, so let me explain. 
Most cytotoxins, when they're produced, remain in the cell membranes. However, if the membrane lyses, then dissolved cytotoxins are released in the water column. And in dynamic flowing systems like rivers and estuaries, discrete grab samples can often miss episodic pulses of cyanotoxins. So this is why we deploy uh, high frequency in situ sensors, because we know that discrete sampling doesn't always tell the whole story. Unfortunately, there are no in situ sensors for toxins, and so SPAT samplers can help provide us some more temporally, temporally integrative data for us to interpret. SPAT stands for solid phase adsorption toxin tracking and are made of an adsorption resin that is held within a mesh pouch. Any dissolved toxins in the water that contact the resin will stick or absorb to the resin. You can then leave the SPAT deployed for several days and it will be accumulating and concentrate onto the resin. You then retrieve the resin and extract the toxins off in the lab and measure them. SPAT complements grab samples very well. Uh, SPAT are very sensitive and you can often get detection on SPAT samplers when grab samples return non However, the method is considered semi-quantitative because we don't know the full adsorption and desorption kinetics during the deployment, and these kinetics also vary for each toxin. But nevertheless, SPAT have proven to be a useful sentinel tool to help characterize the diversity of cytotoxins and their spatial and temporal occurrences within a system. So the data we're collecting uh, will help answer several short-term and long-term research questions, as well as questions that uh, will inform how future monitoring can be conducted in the Delta. So while the research of Peggy Lehman and others have, over the last 20 years has laid a great foundation uh, for our understanding of cyanobacteria in the Delta, uh, much of it was done through special studies and there still remains no consistent um, Delta-wide data collection for cyanotoxins across the system. And so by generating a multi-year data set um, for toxins, we are hoping to begin to be go beyond some of our understanding of microcystis and microcystin and answer questions about the spatial temporal distribution of toxins in the Delta, uh, what factors are driving their production, how to forecast toxins, and ultimately then how we can manage and protect aquatic and public health from these stressors. Uh, however, this effort is just beginning. And so today I'll just be sharing data on the detection of different toxins and taxa in our data from 2020 and 2021, but you can expect to hear more from us in the years to come as we uh, collect more data and do more thorough analyses. So here is some of the data we've collected so far. I'm gonna start with our fixed station data. So again, here's the map showing where these stations are located. And uh, unfortunately due to COVID and some, and some factors outside our control, we have not received all our data back from the lab yet. In this um, table down here, you can see when we've collected samples uh, and all the yellow squares are months where we collected data but have not received those results back from the lab. Uh, you can also see that we collected, um, started collecting samples at the Jersey Point and Tolan station uh, in late 2020, while the other samples uh, collection began in 2021. So of the 87 samples that have been analyzed so far, uh, three toxins were detected, microcystins, anabinopeptins, and anatoxins. And these detections mostly occurred in the summer and the fall. You can see that here on the map with X axis shows the month of the year and the Y axis shows the number of samples collected in that month, and then those are colored um, depending on if toxins were collected or not. Uh, one thing to note too, though, is that the anatoxins were only detected in April. And so this was earlier in the year than the anabinopeptins or microcystins. And so uh, that is a little bit of an outlier for that toxin. Uh, notably too, um, Peggy Lehman had a paper that came out last year looking at data from 2014 to 2018. And in that paper, they detected microcystins, anatoxins, and saxitoxins. Um, and in our data, we have yet to detect saxitoxins. And in general, the concentration of these toxins in the samples was relatively low um, and was below the um, warning level um, for the, uh, the recreational warning level um, from the CC, California Cyanohab Network. Uh, maybe one outlier was we had one anabinopeptin sample at 178 micrograms per liter, uh, while all the other samples were between zero and 31. So we'll have to see as we get more data in if we continue to get high anabinopeptin results or if that remains an outlier. In terms of where the toxins were detected, um, this table here is showing the percentage of detections from all the samples at each site. So you can see that uh, the anabinopeptins were detected at every site except Liberty Island. 
Uh, but anatoxins, in contrast, were only detected at the Tolan and Jersey Point sites, which are more in the central delta. Uh, and then microcystins, again, were detected at every site except Liberty. Um, but one thing to note is there was a high frequency of detections at um, the MDM and the Rough and Ready Island site in the southern delta. And um, this is matches with our understanding and other data where um, that southern delta is where we see the highest microcystis and microcystin concentrations in other um, data sets. And now switching gears to the actual the taxa that are present and might be producing these toxins. Um, three of the common potentially toxigenic taxa that impact water bodies across the world are microcystis, delicospermum, and a phanosomenon. And all three of these taxa were detected in our samples so far, um, and particularly in the summer, um, summer months. And we're still waiting for the full phytoplankton um, analysis to be completed, but for what we have so far, we are seeing these three taxa present. Now, I just showed you the whole water sample data, but now if we look at the SPAT data that were deployed at the fixed stations, um, we see some similar trends where microcystins, and anatoxins, and anabinopeptins were detected. Um, and however, the detections only occurred at Jersey Point at Tolan, um, but we are still waiting a lot of the SPAT data from the other sites, so we don't really have the full data set yet. But in these two sites, there was an interesting seasonal pattern where uh, in the summer and fall, we detected microcystins in these sites. And then in around December and January, the pattern flips, where in the spring and early parts of the year, uh, anatoxins are detected. Uh, and so this might indicate that uh, in the winter and spring, we've got anatoxin producing taxa present, and then that taxa gets replaced by a microcystin producing taxa. Now, I don't have time to share all the mapping data with you, but I did want to just provide a quick um, highlight of what these data are starting to show us. So during the mapping surveys, what we do is we put a um, spat sampler in this cooler, and then we pump water continuously through the cooler, and we'll drive around for several kilometers, and then we'll remove one spat sampler and put in another one. And so we know which portion of the delta each spat sampler had been exposed to. Uh, and then we can generate these maps showing um, the detections of different toxins um, in the different regions of the delta. And this is the map from October 2020. And one of the things I want to draw attention to is that we were detecting microcystins in the Cache Slough complex, as well as high up on the Sacramento River. And these are areas where our discrete sampling um, has almost never um, detected toxins here. And so um, this would match our understanding where SPAT is often more sensitive to toxin detection. And this might uh, be indicative that we do have some low abundance of toxin producers in areas of the delta where we didn't think they um, previously had inhabited. So um, we're excited that we've been funded to continue this mapping in 2022 by the state water contractors and the Delta Science Program. And so this mapping data set will be expanding and we'll um, be able to present more thoroughly on that in a future talk. So in conclusion, uh, when we think about what toxins are present, uh, we're finding uh, microcystins in the Southern Delta, anatoxins in the Central, in the central Delta, However, our SPAT mapping data are, um, might be suggesting that the, the range of these toxins is, is larger than we are thinking from the discrete sampling. Uh, also, uh, anatoxins could be occurring earlier in the year than the microcystins. Then in terms of taxa, we are detecting microcystis, delicospermum, and a phanosomenon uh, in the system. And uh, we really don't know too much about what delicospermum and a phanosomenon are doing. Uh, in terms of next steps, um, the, this, these projects are funded through 2024 and will be having reports and publications to follow. Um, the mapping, as I mentioned, is funded just through 2022. And we also have some additional drought funding from Department of Water Resources to look at the impact of the drought barriers on cyanobacteria and Frank's tract in the central delta, as well as some field validation of remote sensing algorithms. So again, we'd like to thank and acknowledge all the funders of this work and our collaborators. I want to thank the IEP for the opportunity to, pre to present at this workshop. And uh, please uh, let us know if you have any questions and feel free to contact us uh, down the road too. Thank you very much. Great, thanks Keith. That was a really interesting presentation. I know I've been anticipating it for a while. <laughs> All right, we already got questions right out the gate. So Jason Hazrick says, is there a straightforward protocol that could be used across the network of monitoring programs to monitor for cyanotoxins in the estuary? 
Yeah, that's a great, good question, Jason. And um, there's been talk of that is already um, beginning. So some of the um, goals of the work that we were funded to do was to um, start to identify some best best practices um, that could potentially help standardize those monitoring efforts. Um, and again, it's great that um, this work is a, a good collaboration with BWR and the Environmental Monitoring Program who are collecting loads of other data in the estuary. And so I want to again highlight um, our gratitude and the, the great collaboration there, especially the field crews. Um, Morgan there has done a, a great job uh, sort of picking on this extra task of adding the cyanotoxins to, um, to their sampling regime. Um, and there's a new project work team that got launched or kind of rebooted, focused on the HABs focus. So these are some of the conversations we're starting to, or wanting to have in the next um, uh, you know, months and years ahead to try and uh, get those protocols in place so that other entities can be monitoring the same way. Great, it looks like our next question is, so what do you think is the taxa present in winter spring? That is the anatoxin A producer and that's from Becky Stanton. Yeah, I think that's definitely one of the next questions I wanna tackle. Uh, I think some of the contenders would be the Dilicospermum and the Phantosomenon, which both our data and also um, the data that Peggy Lehman um, has been collecting and alluded to in her talk. Um, those taxa are known anatoxin producers, uh, but we haven't uh, identified if they are the um, are actually producing in this system. Um, that's probably where I'd like to start. And then um, if, if it turns out it's not them, then there are some other um, members or other taxa have been identified at um, lower densities than those two. And so we'll have to just keep, keep looking. Great. Thank you. Um, I am not seeing any other questions and we have a couple minutes. So I'm going to ask a question that I've been wanting to know your thoughts on that we could discuss further in the project work team is from what I understand on the chlorophyll A sensor on the YSI, there's like a blue green algae component. And I think that's to measure uh, phycocyanin pigments. Has there been, have you, has USGS considered looking into that at all um, with adding that to their stations or is that turned on already at their stations? Yeah, so before I joined USGS, Brian Bergamoski in our group has done a lot of work on the, um, the different floor metric sensors. Um, when we compare some of our FICO, FICO cyanin is the, the um, parameter you're looking at. When we've compared that to some of our phytoenumeration data, um, the correlations haven't been that great. Um, and so it's, it's also a challenge in that there's not a, a very standardized laboratory method for extracting phycocyanin. So you, you're we're sort of running up against um, uncertainties in both the in situ measurement as well as the laboratory measurement. Um, uh, and um, we don't currently, um, the, the closest project we have currently on that is we have been deploying these other sensors called flora probes, which are um, made by BBE Moldenki. And um, the uh, EMP also uses these. Uh, and those will break out the phytoplankton composition into cyanobacteria, diatoms, cryptophytes, and um, chlorophytes or green algae. And um, we are seeing better performance from that sensor than some of the other ones. Um, but I would um, would be happy to follow up with that conversation. I think it'd be a good topic for our, our project work team, but I don't remember all the results of Brian's work off the top of my head right now. Great, thanks, Keith. And it's about time to switch over to our next presenter. So thanks for your time, really Great. appreciate it. Thank you. Um, our next talk is gonna be from Ellen Priest from Robertson Bryan. And we're very excited for her to be here and we'll let her get started. Good afternoon, my name is Ellen Priest, and I'm with Robertson Bryan Incorporated. My talk today is the, on the accumulation of the cyanotoxin microcystin, which is a liver toxin, in Sacramento San Joaquin Delta invertebrates, and the focus is on Asian clams and crayfish. So microcystis is the most commonly detected cyanobacteria in the Delta. It was first detected in 1999. And since that first detection, it has occurred more frequently in severity in numerous locations throughout the Delta. Toxins associated with microcystis have been detected at numerous locations. 
um, and downstream in the San Francisco Bay along the coast, wild marine mussels tested positive for microcystins during every month of the year. The source of the microcystin uh, remains unknown, but one hypothesis is that it came from the delta. So based on that and some other studies, um, there's concern that delta cyanobacteria harmful algal blooms are forming toxins that contaminate delta shellfish. So this slide shows some data collected by my co-authors prior to the initiation of our study, and it's focused on the overbite clam, microcystin concentrations in the overbite clam, which are a more a salty brackish water species. And what they found is very high concentrations of microcystin in these species year round. So that background information leads us to the project that I'm discussing today. And our overall project goal was to determine if microcystin, as well as in a subset of sample saxitoxin, are stressors on food webs and native fish species, including managed fish such as green sturgeon. So to pick the sites for our project, we identified locations that had known cyanobacteria issues, and then we coordinated with DWR and CDFW sturgeon team to confirm the sites would also be utilized by sturgeon and that sturgeon could potentially be feeding in those areas. Uh, the juvenile sturgeon, both green and white sturgeon, can really occur anywhere in the delta during all months of the year, but they're known to occur um, in some location, locations more frequently, and so we kept that in mind uh, while developing the, the scope of this project. Although Asian clams are not a primary diet component of sturgeon, they have been found uh, in the stomach gut before, and it is a concern to the resource agencies that toxins from cyanobacteria um, may represent a stressor to these species. So this map shows the 10 locations that we chose for our sampling effort, um, including a couple up in the Cache Slough region, which we expected to serve um, somewhat as a control site because there have not been nearly as many detections of microcystin up in that location. So for the methodology, we're sampling for two years. This project began in July 2020 and will wrap up this July 2022. Uh, we are collecting shellfish samples twice a month from June to October and then once a month from November to May. And we collect the Asian clams and crayfish. Um, so typically, we, we composite all of the samples that come back from the field, and this is usually somewhere between 35 and 50 samples. And so this picture on the left-hand side shows um, one sampling site on one date. And so all of the, the tissue is pulled out of the shells from that and composited, freeze-dried, and then extracted from the toxins. Also collect water samples at these sites on the same frequency. And then we measure microcystin on every sampling date and then saxitoxin on three of the sampling dates. All samples are analyzed using the ADDA ELISA kit. And then a subset of the samples are analyzing, analyzed using LCMS where there's nine different variants. Uh, and we're also using the MMPB method on a subset of the subset uh, just due to cost constraints. Um, and the nice thing about that is that the MMPB method looks at all microcystin variants, <clears throat> of which there are over 200 different variants. Uh, we are also looking at nutrients in the water sample, looking at total nitrogen, total phosphorus, phosphate, ammonia, and nitrate. So now I'm going to get into the results. Uh, these are the what I'm calling all of these initial results because this is not the study hasn't been completed yet. Um, but what you can see is that overall, we have relatively low concentrations of microcystin in the water column. Um, everything is below five micrograms per liter. And you can see that at the Cache River sites and at the Sacramento River sites, um, there's very little microcystin that has been measured. Uh, we're also doing kind of a qualitative analysis of the species of cyanobacteria that are present. And what I really want to show you in this figure is that 
we're seeing cyanobacteria in our samples from July through October, a little bit into November. And in the winter, winter months, there's really no cyanobacteria that we're detecting in our surface samples. And um, it, it doesn't necessarily come across clearly in this figure, but microcystis is the dominant cyanobacteria species. Okay, now I'm going to get into the results of the invertebrates. <clears throat> so these are samples from August 2020 to January 2022. And you can see I have microcystin in nanograms per gram on the y-axis and then the 10 different locations on the x-axis. And that red line represents the tolerable daily intake from EPA. And so anything over that would be considered unsafe for humans to eat. There's not um, a similar metric for, for um, species like sturgeon fish species, but it does give an indication of a human health risk. And you can see that um, most locations um, exceeded that tolerable daily intake. Um, at least sometimes, and the San Joaquin River at Turner Cut did quite a few times. Okay, this is that same set of data that I just showed you, but I've combined the sites here and I'm looking at it across months. And what we're seeing um, is not unexpected, and that is that we're seeing most of the toxin presence in the summer months um, of July through November, and really very little toxin accumulation uh, in the shellfish during the winter months. However, the toxin still remains present at low levels in the winter months. Okay, so this figure, um, we had the opportunity at some of the sites to collect extra samples and we split them into two size classes to see if there was a difference between the large and the small um, size classes, that's one of these size classes have more toxin than the other, and uh, we, we didn't find any significant difference between the size classes. Okay, so this figure was um, looking at crayfish, so we're moving on to the crayfish. We don't have nearly as many crayfish as we do as our clams. Um, we have 18 crayfish from Cache Slough, and we have 11 crayfish from other delta locations, and so uh, this also lines up with what we saw for the clams, a little to no microcystin uh, in the cash slough, but really high concentrations, exceeding that EPA tolerable daily intake, once again, of that red line um, on numerous occasions. The maximum microcystin measured, um, it's not shown just because if I show it on this scale, you wouldn't be able to see uh, these box plots, but the maximum was 1,752 nanograms per gram in August 2021 at San Joaquin River at Turner Cut. So I only had enough, um, we only had enough data to, to do this analysis at Cashley at Ryer Island and was curious if the crayfish had higher concentration than the clams. And it appears uh, so far that they do. The crayfish seem to bioaccumulate the, the toxin at greater amounts, perhaps because they're a step up in the trophic level. All right, so this slide, I mentioned that we were able to send a subset of our ELISA samples to LCMS analysis, and so this figure represents 15 samples so far that have been tested by both methodologies. And what we found is that um, which is consistent with uh, other studies, is that the ELISA measures a slightly higher amount of microcystin than the LCMS method, but that there's generally very good agreement between the two methods. Um, the reason that ELISA is measuring more microcystin is not 100% known, but the LCMS was only tar targeting nine of the over 200 microcystin variants, whereas the ELISA method um, was designed to detect um, all microcystin variants by um, every microcystin variant has a unique ADDA side chain, and so the ELISA is able to detect that. Okay, so moving on to the nutrients in the water column. 
Um, it's got a lot on these figures, but what I want you to take away from them is that total nitrogen and total phosphorus were consistently the highest at the San Joaquin River at Turner Cut. That's also where we had the highest concentration of microcystin in the clams. Okay, and this figure is the dissolved nutrients, so the nutrients that uh, the phytoplankton and the cyanobacteria really like to utilize. We have ammonia on the top figure and orthophosphate on the phosphorus on the bottom figure. Um, and then every sample collection date is on the y-axis. And similar story, that pink line is showing you that San Joaquin River at Turner Cut uh, generally has the highest nutrient concentrations. However, for the ammonia, it was interesting that we captured uh, the regional sand upgrade. And so, as you can see, that the blue lines that are spiking pretty high on that top ammonia figure are quite high until May or so of 2021 when they uh, put that upgrade in. And since then, the ammonia has decreased dramatically at that location. So now into the conclusions. Overall, our initial findings for water you know, we see the highest microcystins in the San Joaquin River, Old River, Middle River, and Frank's Tract. But um, overall, the, the microcystins in the water column are low. So the maximum that we've measured is 4.6 micrograms per liter. And we're just collecting surface samples. We are not uh, necessarily targeting scummy or more bloom-like areas. So that may be uh, one reason why we're not seeing as high of uh, toxin concentrations. And then the lowest microcystins are consistently at Cache Slough and the Sacramento River and Sherman Lake. The most common genera is microcystis, and there's little to no sign of bacteria in December through June. And then, like I said, the highest nutrients are consistently at the San Joaquin River at Turner Cup. For the Asian clams, we had high microcystin concentrations in many of the samples. The highest microcystins were San Joaquin River at Turner Cut, uh, Sherman Lake, which is one of the areas that is utilized quite a bit by juvenile sturgeon, so sturgeon are definitely feeding in that area. The Middle River at Bacon Island, Frank's Tract, and Old River at Holland Tract. And then low microcystins consistently at Cache Slough. We saw the highest microcystin concentrations in July through November. They frequently exceeded the EPA tolerable daily intake for humans. Um, however, toxins were also persistent in all months. They just didn't uh, exceed that tolerable daily intake um, during the winter months. No significant difference in microcystin between small and large size classes to date. And I didn't show any findings, but there was no saxitoxin in any of the clams that we have processed from November. And we'll still, we have some more to process, so we'll have to see if that holds true. For the crayfish, we found significantly higher microcystin in the crayfish versus the clams at the Cache Slough, Ryer Island site, and much higher concentrations of microcystin in clams from other delta locations versus Cache Slough. So next steps are to wrap up sampling this summer and then dig further into the associations between nutrients and toxin concentrations and also other field parameters such as temperature and pH. You know, and overall, our intended outcomes of this project are to define the potential contamination of benthic prey organisms and identify the areas of the delta um, that have the greatest contamination. And so far that appears to be the San Joaquin River at Turner Cut. One um, that participated. And so I wanna thank Ben Genetics, um, my co-PI and Janice Cook at the Water Boards co-PI and Davidson at SFEI co-PI for helping with this project. The Fishery Foundation for collecting all of the samples and then the, the funding from Top one that made this project happen. Thank you and please let me know if you have any questions. All right, that was a great talk. Thanks Ellen for joining us. Um, I am not seeing any questions in the chat so far, um, but I have a question I guess to kind of get us started is so looks like the toxin concentrations low in the water, but high in the clams and the crayfish. Do you think it's less in the water because the clams and crayfish are like consuming it or, um, or do you just 
have another idea for that, I guess. Yeah, I guess I just assume that maybe they're, they're bioaccumulating because they're feeding um, on the different phytoplankton. And so maybe they're filtering a lot of it through themselves and therefore uh, concentrating it. I thought it was interesting, and I don't know if I mentioned in the talk that at the Sherman Lake site, we saw basically no microcystin in the water column, but that was one of the locations where the clams had some of the highest toxin concentrations. And so that suggests maybe the toxins are coming from a different location. Interesting. Which would make sense just thinking of um, the way that site is set up. It's not a place that's known necessarily for having the blooms as much as the Southern and Central Delta. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we got a question that came in that from, uh, it says, do you know if there's a, any benthic cyanobacteria growing in the study sites? No, we are not looking at that for our study. So we're only looking at the surface water samples and then out there collecting the shellfish from the sediment. Okay. Yeah. I know benthic cyanobacteria are getting a lot of attention right now. And it's a, knowledge gap that we want to understand more. <laughs> it's hard to answer all, answer all the questions though. <laughs> when I couldn't, I, I couldn't ask a question through the q and I guess I should have raised my hand, but I thought it was interesting that Keith mentioned they were seeing really high concentrations of the toxin in the Southern and Central Delta. And I was curious like how that, what high was defined as if that was based on the state danger threshold or like what parameters you were using to define high concentrations because we're really consistently seeing low toxins at our sites. Um, that's, you know what, I may have misspoke. I, they, our values were relatively low. So maybe I um, okay. meant that they are most frequently detected there, but yeah, there are, our results were, um, were not that high. The, um, the one exception being this sort of an emerging area was the anabina peptins um, results, which is something that hasn't been, um, analyze that much in the Delta, but um, in some of the papers I've been reading, it, um, it does seem to be quite um, ubiquitous when it when people are um, do analyze it in blooms, um, but those are our highest values of anabina peptins. So you would say your microcystin were in line with the values I reported then? Oh yeah, actually lower than yours. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a question I, I'm for you wondering. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Go for it, Peggy. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. I, I'm wondering, you know, one of the problems we have with microcystis in particular is that it comes to the surface of the water and stays right on the surface of the water in the big colony. And so if we do a standard graph sample, we really don't get a very good sample of that microcystis on the surface. Do you think that might be influencing things? Yeah, I mean, it, that definitely could be, or it's just a single, you know, space and time that we're collecting a random sample. And so yeah, it's not necessarily showing what's going on through the whole system, which is why the shellfish are kind of nice indicators of um, what may be really happening. Or Peggy, I know you also have done a lot of sampling throughout the water column, which could be useful in the future. We got one question that I wanna just get before um, we move on to our next speaker, but Trisha Lee says, some bivalve store toxins for extended periods of time, like razor clams on the North Coast that were toxic for years despite no blooms. Do you know if this is true in the case? It doesn't appear to be because our winter months, you know, we're really seeing a big drop off um, in the clams and the toxins in the clams. Maybe it's storing it at very low levels because we were finding, you know, the presence of the toxins, but it's dropped off quite a bit since the summer months. But that's a great question. I was wondering the same thing. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much. And then Rosemary Hartman just says, it'll be interesting to compare shellfish data with the stat data. So. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and move on to our next speaker, which is David Karen from the University of Southern California and also Aquatic Eco Technologies. Good afternoon, and thank you for staying for this talk. My name is Dave Karen. I'm a professor at the University of Southern California. And I'm going to tell you today about a study that we conducted using a short-term mitigation strategy in Discovery Bay, California, for trying to treat a microcystis bloom and the microcystins that accompanied the bloom using an eco-friendly approach. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about the use of hydrogen peroxide. 
just to set the stage here Discovery Bay is in the, the little red box here and it is to the the east of San Francisco to the south of Sacramento it's basically on the northwestern edge of the Central Valley and you can see in the blow up there is the this uh, little warren of canals that have been cut into the delta the water enters Discovery Bay largely from the north it moves south and sort of west and then it moves southeast and and out and back into the Delta um, and as you can see in the picture that is set in here it is a site of recurring micro predominantly microcystis cyanobacterial blooms and the microcystins that they contain the little red dot on the insert is where we did our measurements or where we conducted our pilot study and here's a project overview. The study was conducted in 1.5 cubic meter enclosures called limno corrals. The treatments included controls where we just put water into the bags and did nothing to them, a low dosage and a high dosage treatment. Each of those treatments were conducted in triplicate. Uh, the treatments themselves involved the a single addition of hydrogen liquid hydrogen peroxide on day zero. The low dosage was 5 milligrams per liter. The high was 50 milligrams per liter. And those values were based on bracketing literature values that have been used in the past and also uh, commensurate with the amount of chlorophyll uh, biomass that was present in the system. We made measurements over a two week period that included chlorophyll, particulate and dissolved microcystins measured by ELISA relative abundances of major phytoplankton taxa, abundances of microzooplankton, dissolved oxygen, and residual hydrogen peroxide. One may well ask why use peroxide? Well, there are a lot of short-term mitigative approaches that are out there, but most of them, many of them, are problematic, and they're not really long-term solutions for this issue. Uh, copper being a perfect example. Copper is very effective in treating blooms, but with repeated treatments, it does cause buildup of copper in the environment, and it is a toxic compound. So it is something that is much less desirable uh, to leave behind, or not desirable at all. The breakdown products of hydrogen peroxide, in contrast, are water and molecular oxygen. Therefore, there are no deleterious residuals remaining after treatment. And additionally, the cyanobacteria appear to be more susceptible to peroxide than the beneficial eukaryotic algae that are present in the system. Therefore, the dosage can and should be adjusted to be effective against the cyanobacteria, uh, but leaving the desirable non-target species alone. Uh, also, peroxide can degrade cyanotoxins that might be present, and that, as you'll see, is dose-dependent, but they can take care of some of the issue. And then finally, oxygen release during treatment can help alleviate hypoxic conditions, which often follow the demise of a bloom, uh, which creates a lot of dead organic material, and the ensuing bacterial degradation can use oxygen. Those hypoxic and anoxic conditions can result in undesirable impacts in and of themselves, such as fish kills. So here's a bird's eye view of our setup. You can see some of the limno corrals here at the uh, along the dock uh, in Discovery Bay. Again, these are 1.5 cubic meter volumes. They have ambient light, ambient temperature. They're open to the atmosphere at the surface, but they have a, they are solid liners. There is no direct contact between Discovery Bay and the contents of the bags themselves. On the lower photo here, you can see a number of these bags that are, are dockside before pretreatment. You can see how green they are. <clears throat> Excuse me. Once treatment does take place, and on the right hand uh, side here that this picture shows you two treated bags in the upper portion of that figure, and then an untreated control bag in the lower portion, and you can see that whitish material in the treated bags, that is the dead cyanobacteria that are accumulating at the surface, whereas in the control bag that accumulation is doing just fine at the surface. That's following only a day of treatment, just one day. After about three days, on the left, you can see a treated and an untreated bag next to one another, and you can definitely see the difference in, in the green uh, hue of the untreated control. Well, if we look at what's going on in those bags now, uh, this figure shows you chlorophyll, 
with uh, micrograms of chlorophyll per liter on the y-axis and days 0 to 14 of the experiment on, on the uh, x-axis. And first, if you look at the gray, these are the control treatments. And you can see there was a lot of chlorophyll, 50 to 60 micrograms at the beginning of the experiment. Uh, that did drop off as we went on with the experiment, un unfortunate for us, good for Discovery Bay. Uh, but these are natural blooms, so we had no control over what they were doing. But if you look at the one day, uh, the yellow or the orange and the blue show you what's going on inside the low and the high dosage treatments respectively. And as you can see, the, the chlorophyll was brought much more into control relative to concentrations in Discovery Bay, and it remained that way for the 14-day extent of the experiment. So right off the bat, we're seeing very good news in that the overall chlorophyll concentrations were dramatically affected by the additions of hydrogen peroxide. If we now look at the particulate microcystins, of course, this is, these are the microcystins that are mostly contained within the microcystis cells themselves. And particulate microcystin concentration here uh, on the y-axis now, we were, had about 2 micrograms of microcystins in the, the water when we enclosed it. Again, that did drop off as the bloom dropped off as the experiment went on, even in the controls. But the immediate impact you can see in the low and the high dosages, again in orange and blue, uh, is that the concentrations of microcystins in the particulate fraction in the cells were knocked right down. And that's commensurate with actually killing cells and, and getting rid of those cyanobacteria. And it stayed down uh, throughout the particulate concentration, stayed down throughout the experiment. If we look at what that looks like in terms of cells, uh, this picture shows you some a cyanobacterial colony of microcystis in the control bags in the upper left and then in a treated bag in the, the lower right. The, the dense color that you see is because these are Lugol's stained samples, so lots of nice healthy cells in the colony in the upper left. And then the colony in the lower right definitely shows the effect of hydrogen peroxide. You can see sort of amorphous, poorly staining cells which is indicative that the cyanobacteria are, are being killed. Uh, you can also see a couple of golden cells, uh, sort of mid picture, a little lower than mid, and then some golden cells down at the bottom. And these are eukaryotic algae, which have presumably uh, handled the hydrogen peroxide just fine. They're still in, in good condition, which is a very good sign as well. If we look at the dissolved microcystins uh, in the system now during the during the pilot study, uh, they showed a very different uh, situation. The first in the controls, here you can see the concentration started low and it remained low for the entire time. This is not unexpected because the microcystins at the beginning, remember we had about two micrograms of microcystins per liter in the particulate fraction, it's all contained within cells. And here there's relatively little of it getting out into the dissolved phase. If we look first at the dissolved microcystins in the high treatment, we see a very interesting picture. Here you see that right off the bat, uh, or at least for three days, the concentrations are low and they remained low. Uh, also, the particulate fraction was low and remained low throughout this treatment. Therefore, the, the total microcystins were knocked down quite a bit, and the dissolved phase did not increase. Uh, it did, however, increase around day 5, 7, and 9. And as an explanation for what seems to be going on here is if we now look at residual hydrogen peroxide concentration, in these in the high treatments the blue here you can see we started at 50 micrograms excuse me milligrams of hydrogen peroxide per liter and that value decreased gradually and, and rapidly as the days went on until it was just about gone at day five and day five and seven is about where the concentrations of the dissolved phase of microcystins increased so we do seem to be getting some bounce back of, of the system, at least in the dissolved phase, not in the particulate phase, when we treat with the high dosage. 
Um, the, the low dosage of hydrogen peroxide here you can see started at 5 milligrams per liter and it dropped off very quickly. It was barely noticeable after even one day. So if we now look at the dissolved microcystin concentration in this treatment, that is in the low treatment, interestingly, the microcystin concentrations in the dissolved phase went up dramatically in, uh, at day one when the cyanobacteria themselves were killed and the particulate concentration uh, dropped precipitously. So obviously what's going on here is the microcystins that were present in the cyanobacteria were those were released to the environment when we kill the cells with the low concentration of peroxide which was not able to also take out the dissolved microcystins. So we have some interesting information to, to kind of chew on here and try and figure out how we're going to move forward with this. If we look at the phytoplankton community composition during this time it is also very interesting. Uh, the controls are given on the top uh, this is relative abundances, the low dosage in the middle, high dosage on the bottom. What we find are that cyanobacteria dominated all the way through the experiment, even during the demise of the bloom in the control limnocorals. In the low and the high dosage treatments, however, the, the cyanobacteria dropped right off and chlorophyll or chlorophytes and to some degree cryptophytes and diatoms kind of backfill that ecological space. And that's exactly what we're hoping to see here. We're, we want to see those concentrations um, a change or those abundances change in a way that the, the beneficial algae take over. Finally, if we look at the microzooplankton abundances, that's shown here. Uh, the microzooplankton abundances and the controls were rather variable. They were rather variable in all three treatments. Uh, but what we can see is by the end of this uh, experiment, the abundances at day 14 in the low dosage or in the high dosage are at least as good as they are in the controls. So again, very good news. We're not having a deleterious effect on the desirable components of the food web. And then just to give you a little bit of information on dissolved oxygen, at the beginning of the experiment, uh, that is with in the controls throughout and, and in the ambient water, dissolved oxygen was very high. This is above saturation and that is a consequence of the fact that there is a huge bloom producing lots of oxygen. So we measured high oxygens. When you treat with hydrogen peroxide, uh, that doesn't seem to change all that much. In fact, in the high dosage, the oxygen went up even more, which again means that it's meeting the, the biological oxygen demand. Once the cells are killed, um, it's maintaining high oxygen. It did go down a little bit in the, um, in the low dosage, but then it, it sort of plateaus out after about a week. So, conclusions and lessons learned. Uh, first of all, I think peroxide is definitely worth pursuing as a short-term, eco-friendly, mitigative approach to do short-term mitigation, uh, uh, at least towards the cyanobacterial bloom here. Um, efficacy is dose-dependent, however. We need to figure that out. Uh, also, the short-term toxin removal is dose-dependent. The high dose eliminated it, the low dose released it, and there was some bounce back, so, so there's still some work to be uh, done there, some information to be gained. Uh, lessons learned towards optimization, I would say first of all we need to adjust the hydrogen peroxide to existing biomass. One size does not fit all. We do need to have some measure of how much will be effective and is needed in any particular instance. We need to work at how to prevent the bounce back of cyanobacteria. And what I'd suggest is that low chronic dosages may be more effective, and that's something we're looking into now. And, and we want to get ahead of the bloom as much as we can. We want to nip this in the bud. That's generally known, but the details are still largely to be determined. And that is where we are right now, and we hope to move forward very soon on our next run. All right, thanks Dave for presenting. Um, I'm gonna start with Andrea and then I'll go to Peggy. That was the next person I saw, but Andrea says, uh, has a question saying it's 
Ben suggested that microcystins were produced as a response to oxidative stress. Do you think the hydrogen peroxide addition could have triggered production and excretion of the microcystin in the environment? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, yes, the short short answer would be yes. Uh, I'd say yes, but uh, the oxidative stress, the way and the reason that cyanobacteria, at least the publications that are, are on this topic, indicate that the reason the cyanobacteria tend to be more susceptible than other eukaryotic algae to hydrogen peroxide, particularly low concentrations, is that it, it creates an oxidative stress on these organisms that, that pushes them towards what is believed to be a programmed cell, uh, cell death. This is an apoptotic effect. Uh, it does shift physiological functions in quite a way. One of those may, and I think the, it's less clear, but it, it certainly may be to produce micro, uh, microcystins. Um, that being said, um, as I said at the end of the talk, which I have to say is a really weird way to give a talk, to watch yourself give a talk. But um, the at the end of that talk, I, I did mention that the, the trick here, I think, is to get out in front of the bloom. Treating a bloom with anything is very tricky, whether it's you know something tried and true like copper, um, which will kill cells for sure, but releases a ton of toxin. We know that it also can drive down the oxygen um, or whether it's hydrogen peroxide. And that's what we're trying to work out here. Peroxide is less utilized so far in the United States, but it certainly has great potential, far more than dumping a ton, literally a ton of copper in the water. So uh, this is something that we need to work out. And I think the way to do this is to get in front of the bloom and not let the bloom really get out of control. Um, I do wanna stress, this is a short-term mitigative approach. It does nothing to reduce nutrient loads in the water. That's not what it is designed for. Uh, it really is when people, when water managers have a problem and they need to address that problem, this is an approach that, that may have more legs than some of the more traditional ones that have been used. But yes, that whole Thanks. idea of whether apoptosis is taking place needs to get worked out. Thanks, Dave. You have a couple more questions. I want to try to get them in the next couple minutes. Peggy has her hand raised, so I'll let Peggy go next. Okay. Yeah, I'm wondering. Um, this has some potential. I'm I'm noticing we're we're working on this in these little small uh, areas. How do you foresee this would be applied in an area as big as the Delta? Peggy, it's, it's almost like I planted you. Um, I think the, the, the next step is to step it up to a quote unquote real environment. We are in the process now of designing and getting under contract to do a pilot study in Discovery Bay, uh, actually in Willow Lake of Discovery Bay, using the outside part, the, the Discovery Bay proper as the quote unquote control area. That experiment, if we get everything dotted and crossed for I's and T's, we're going to be doing that this summer. And, and that will, in fact, be exactly the approach that I wanted to, that I just mentioned, which is to start at the beginning of the summer before the bloom gets out of control to see if we can control it. If that, and, and then to run that through the summer, if that um, quote unquote experiment works, if that pilot study works, I can envision ways that this could be rolled out uh, in something as large as the Delta, at least to address areas, hot spots, such as Stockton, you know, which um, I think probably Ellen will tell you, you know, seems to be a hot spot for the development of these blooms. If you take care of it in those locations, um, you may be saving a lot of damage downstream, so to speak. So I, we are trying to do that next step, literally. Thanks, Dave. Um, it's uh, Jana says she wants to acknowledge the State Water Resource Control Board supported this project via 205 grant funds from the US EPA. Um, and then there's another um, question in the chat, so maybe you can answer it um, through the chat from Andrew. Uh, sure. But we're going to move on to our last and final talk. I'm excited because it's Marissa and I, and Marissa is gonna share her screen. Uh, we um, are going to introduce the Freshwater Harmful Algal Bloom Program that's statewide, and um, that is part of Assembly Bill 834 that got implemented recently, and I 
think it looks like it's just starting to pop up. So take it away, Marissa. Thanks, Jenna. So you can see it on your end? It's disappeared on my end. <laughs> yes, it looks great. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, you guys. We wanted to close out with a live, um, a live presentation. So again, my name is Marissa Van Dyke. Really excited to be able to speak with IEP folks today and thank you to all the organizers of the session and events this week. All right, so um, I'm gonna be speaking about most of the content of the presentation, handing it back and forth to Jenna. I um, just wanna go over the outline of what we're gonna cover. So um, the FAP program staff have been working to implement the program across the state and share resources and tools and also support regional priorities. I'll be showing you brief snapshots of many of the resources and tools that are available to you. And the slides have direct web links for you to take a closer look. And so um, when we finish, we'll put a link to download a PDF of this um, so you can have it handy if you'd like. Some of the next steps the program is working on is uh, collaborating with the Delta Science Program on monitoring strategies and also supporting the integration, sorry, integration of a new HAB data management app called the Water Reporter app, if, in case you've heard of it so far. Um, we're also working to expand remote sensing capabilities to support needs in uh, the Delta and other areas where um, folks would like to see higher resolution data to see narrower or, or um, smaller water bodies. And we also wanna introduce you to a monitoring opportunity that's available for the summer. Um, and again, you know, we want to collaborate on development of products that are useful to you. So please contact Jenna to highlight any projects that are of interest. All right, so a little bit about the program before we get into more of the details. Um, the program began at the water boards in 2016. And this is when formal tracking of HAB reports began in California, though, you know, HABs had been occurring previously, but we started tracking the reports that came into a state agency to the water boards. And the main focus was at that time and continues to be uh, the HAB event response, uh, which focuses on recreational waters and surveillance for source water. And most recently, the Assembly Bill 834 was approved and um, that formalized the program with the focus of not only freshwater, but also expanded it to cover estuarine areas as well. And with the bill's annual funding and a full-time staff, um, the two agencies were able to attain staff that includes the water boards and the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And uh, that hiring was completed last spring. So we kind of feel like a new, new group again. Um, and the bill, uh, the assembly bill that was approved identifies many objectives that really expands the purpose of the program much beyond instant response and also includes prioritizing comprehensive monitoring and assessment in many scales, statewide, regional, um, you know, water body specific to track stats and trends. Another objective is also to develop data infrastructure needs to support um, the, you know, the infrastructure that's needed for monitoring programs to get up. Okay, so we wanted to give you a snapshot of where we're all distributed, the full-time staff. Um, and um, with that, um, myself um, and Carly Nielsen, where the statewide program leads, were located at the State Water Board uh, in Sacramento. And we uh, implement this program in very close collaboration with all of the regional water boards. And uh, the full-time staff there is limited amount. Um, and so uh, they were distributed at three different regional water boards that covers a pretty good chunk of the Northern half of California. And um, for the Delta and Central Valley, Karen Atkins is the HAB coordinator and comes with a really a wealth of knowledge about algae and HABs. And so uh, next up, Gajena is gonna give you an overview of the infrastructure at the department. Yeah, so at CDFW, we have a similar structure to the State Water Resource Control Board where um, I am housed at headquarters and I work really closely with our regional offices for when a harmful algal bloom is reported, I contact the regional biologist and uh, additional staff as needed to notify them of a harmful algal bloom. My main role in the Freshwater Harm for Algal Bloom program is to help focus on fish and wildlife impacts. So the State Water Resource Control Board has a lot of other priorities. Um, what we know is that Delta, which is why we're all here, is um, the San Francisco Estuary is a very important watershed. And 
we are so excited that IEP exists because other regions in California don't have IEP or a structure like this. So we are really excited to partner with IEP and to leverage efforts that are already existing and we can integrate them pretty seamlessly. Next slide, please, Marissa. And how I plan to um, do this is um, we have the IEP phytoplankton and water quality project work team. Uh, before I received my position, we had a water quality project work team, but it wasn't meeting um, real frequently. And so I worked with IEP to um, create a phytoplankton water quality project work team and we're including harmful algal blooms inside of it as well. Um, the reason why we're lumping this all together is a lot of these surveys and IEP that collect water quality are also heavily related to the um, collecting harmful algal blooms and also cyanobacteria. Our goal of our project work team is to communicate who's doing what, provide recommendation and leverage opportunities. And I'm really excited to have this, to um, have this as a foundation to start um, having some discussions and create recommendations for the future. However, um, as we all know, IEP has a lot of data. So next slide, Marissa. Um, and so I'm also part of the data utilization work group. Um, the Doug and IEP surveys have done tremendous great work of creating and publishing their data and metadata on EDI or other open data repositories. And my goal is to really leverage off these efforts and to um, take what is published and integrate into the um, database in uh, FHAB program uh, information that we're building onto. So from here, um, I wanted to keep in mind if you're a part of these work groups, uh, Marissa is going to show us a bunch of tools that are really useful. And if you're interested, please let me know. And we can talk about further in our project work teams or the Doug or uh, individually, as you see. So take it away, Marissa. Thanks, Jenna. So um, I'm going to be providing a quick overview of some of the HAB resources and tools that we have available on the California HABs portal. And this is a centralized state website for all things freshwater and estuarine HABs. And uh, many, many other entities also um, contribute to the content of this, this website. So um, I've got a lot of uh, web links coming up. So again, we'll give you a PDF of this presentation so that you can take a closer look. Because uh, again, I'm going to go over this material pretty um, quickly. So the portal um, has a lot of different resources, and we generally categorize them to answer um, you know, four different questions. You know, where are HABs, how to stay safe, and so forth. And so getting at, you know, um, where are HABs, there's a couple different mapping tools, and I'll show you those actually in a little bit more detail, which is good. Um, it's more of an interest to many, of the, many folks. And also um, we have resources as well to discuss, um, sorry, to provide information on how to stay safe. Um, and these uh, include web pages and um, handouts and fact sheets for many different audiences on protecting yourself, family, different animal groups from HABs. We also have um, tracking of illnesses. We have an illness work group and a web page dedicated to that material and resources for animal veterinarians and medical professionals. The portal also contains a um, HAB field guide for assessing blooms when they occur, including standard operating procedures and uh, to help us collect data in more of a standardized process. And a pretty big chunk of the website also has material on how to respond to incidents um, of plumes. And um, we have a response plan that's coordinated by the water boards and along with the local agencies as necessary. All right, so I said I'd go into the map, mapping tools a little bit more detail. Um, so again, you know, how to um, answer where our HABs. Uh, we have a reports map. So it's an interactive, statewide map and data dashboard that was launched back in 2016 to display all the HAB reports that are submitted to the water boards. Again, the submission of reports is voluntary, so it's the, the reports that we're aware of um, from different, you know, from the public and from monitoring entities. Um, and I uh, wanted to highlight that the reporting is done through an online report form, and it's available for anyone to submit. Um, but for um, you all, I just want to highlight that if you're out monitoring and you observe a bloom, you can submit a report for each site that you sub, um, 
that you see a bloom and you can then follow up by email with us um, on updates as you go back to those sites and we can provide that uh, those updates onto this interactive map because um, each report that's published to the map um, you know goes through water board staff review just a little bit uh, before we publish um, pretty real time you know sometimes the same day or within the next day and each dot on the map um, you know again represents a site and you can hover over it and see more information and of course um, any updates that are submitted to us and we're planning on redesigning this map um, starting at the end of this year and we'll announce when we're ready you know for peers to review it we'd like to better showcase monitoring data separate from um, public reports all right and the second mapping tool that we have on the portal um, is the satellite sinohab map and you know remote sensing continues to be hot topics so i just wanted to give you a little bit more details on this um, so it was developed to support water managers and agencies to respond to bloom events. And satellite algorithms were developed by scientists to estimate the abundance of cyanobacteria in the surface of, of water bodies. And the map data, um, sorry, the map uh, that are presented in this tool of certain waterways it presents already the pre-processed satellite imagery for you to take a look. And um, it's somewhat limited, but it does cover the majority of our largest lakes, reservoirs, and wider channels, approximately 250 of them across the state. So some areas of the delta can be viewed, um, like for example, in this image, there's Frank's tracts. And, um, but you know, some of the channels are a little too narrow to be seen with the currently available satellite imagery on the tool. Um, and, I, and I wanted to highlight that the imagery that's presented is, um, it presents a 10 day average of what, what has been seen um, you know, over time and uh, the density or the abundance of cyanobacteria is presented on that heat map. And we have historical data from many locations back to 2002. And uh, we wanted to go over a lot of like our next steps in the program and opportunities to collaborate with us. So I wanna highlight a few things regarding satellite imagery. Um, in particular, we're working to improve data accessibility by other entities to this tool. For example, we're developing an API so that partners can interface with this tool and download the data sets that you'd like. So for example, if you don't want a 10 day average, you can download other data sets as long as you let us know while we're in development of this API. We're also working to add remotely sense chlorophyll A to this tool. Um, so that would be presented alongside what's already there. And we are, um, I'm sorry, we have begun working with NOAA at the federal level and with contractors to um, look into bringing higher resolution data to the tools so we can provide co um, coverage of narrower water bodies, um, including hopefully some of the narrower channels in the Delta. All right, so now I'm gonna be focusing on a few other kind of um, uh, of our next steps, uh, primarily around monitoring and monitoring strategies. So last year, a strategic framework for monitoring was completed, and um, that report, uh, the full link is down below, and it, you know, it happened to coincide with a lot of us all being hired uh, for this formal program. Uh, that was just a coincidence. So, um, so the um, strategic framework lays out a long-term plan for statewide uh, monitoring and also information on or a framework on how to also um, apply monitoring at different scales as well. And the resulting framework uh, comprehensively explored many options and recommendations for HAB monitoring. And this figure here, I wanted to um, highlight a few things that in this figure, it shows that, you know, how multiple partners that can come together, approaches for monitoring and supporting infrastructure can lead to the protection of us getting to, um, you know, helping us get to uh, protecting beneficial uses from HABs. And remote sensing and partner-led monitoring really key approaches to the monitoring program that we're implementing. And availability of this higher resolution satellite imagery um, and um, decision, better uh, decision support tools that ingest this imagery and partner monitoring data is really critical to the success of this program that we're, we're getting off the ground. And we also wanna highlight that with the infrastructure that we're building um, even now and I'm about to launch um, a little bit more, um, we are building a robust data infrastructure based off open data principles and including procedures to help us uh, collect data in a comparable way. And all together, um, this will help us lead to well-informed management actions to help uh, prevent and mitigate HABs. 
Right, and on the data infrastructure um, front, um, you know, that's really important for monitoring programs and Jennifer, uh, Jenna was already highlighting that for you um, with, the, with the Doug, that Doug work group. So um, with that, I wanna highlight that the FHUB program is partnered with nonprofits called the Commons and the Internet of Water to bring a web app with PAD data infrastructure or sorry, structure to California monitoring entities and it's called Water Reporter. So it's a web-based app that also has mobile-friendly platforms for smartphone and tablets that provides users with their own customized data management tools for data collection and storage and visual, visual, sorry, visualizations, which are really important, and really will help us streamline our data sharing. So the focus of the tool is to support our engagement with tribes, community groups, and local entities around data sharing. And accounts are free um, for this app for partners of the FHAB program, including um, folks in IEP. Um, so we want to really promote this to you and uh, highlight that this is also, um, you know, it won't just help us um, share data from IEP to the FHAB program, but the apps has integrated visualizations, which also helps you to establish a monitoring network because you can see what other entities are monitoring, maybe just nearby you. And with each, um, with Water Reporter, I wanted to go in a little bit more detail to show that each organization can, you know, create a unique account with many different staff members contributing data. And you can import data with um, a spreadsheet or you can create your own digital data collection forms. And in that you can put all sorts of quantifiable data, including lab results, field measurements, and even upload photos specific to each site that you're you know, adding data to. So you won't lose your photos and it'll help name them too, name those files. Um, and also, again, uh, the system has integrated data visits so that you don't have to like go out of this program and you know visualize your data separately, but you can see it in here and you can see what kind of data has been collected for your program stations in one spot. So looking forward, um, this app can already be used to collect data from surveys in the Delta um, because the have data structures are established in the app or waiting on is the automatic connections from the app to the FHAB program database which will be ready this summer. Um, so you know, with that, it would help streamline data sharing across entities and actually near real time because it will have a daily connection. And Jenna will be integrating this tool in the data workflow of the data utilization work group or Doug. All right, and one of our last next steps we wanna to highlight to you is that we've been expanding our surveys to protect human health. And um, the FHAB program coordinates monitoring prior to three major summer holiday weekends. And we call these the pre-holiday assessments. And we started expanding this um, last year to cover all three holidays. And IEP um, can participate in these surveys by sampling recreational areas used by, um, you know, used by others for bathing, fishing, and boating. Um, so, you know, some areas that you already go out to, if they're used for these, um, these kind of recreation activities can be included. So please sign up if you're interested in covering um, certain areas of the Delta by completing a brief survey and we'll put a link in the chat. Um, we're hoping to get survey responses by early May and we have some funding for lab analysis as well. And to give you an idea like what we kind of covered last summer um, for all the surveys, um, sorry, for each survey, we covered approximately 60 waterways across the state and only a few of the sites were in the Delta. So there's definitely room to expand. All right, and in closing, um, we want to highlight that uh, there's a workshop um, in a development and we're working with um, the Delta Science Program to have the, you know, this workshop come about. We're developing um, uh, for it to, um, the, one of the outcomes will be to uh, develop a specific Delta strategy to monitor and manage HABs. And the committee's almost finalized and more info will be sh uh, shared soon. And then also we wanted to highlight again the uh, water reporter. So if you have any questions about that, please contact Jenna. And there's also support from water reporter staff to give you training and get you set up on accounts as well. And here's our contacts. So please let us know if you're interested. Thank you. Thanks, Marissa. We have, um, I think we have time for one quick question. And it's from Frances Wilkerson. She said, I missed what data is used in the satellite tool. It's not chlorophyll A, but do you remotely sent cyanobacteria somehow from their sensor. I think it's about the CI index if you wanna go into a little bit. Right, right. So what the satellite imagery is um, uh, presenting on the, on the map is the cyanobacteria abundance estimated as um, 
uh, something that was called CI CINO. It's a, the, the parameter CI CINO is a unit list parameter and the scale of it is presented on, on the legend. And there's a little bit like question mark there where you can read a little bit more about like what it's sensing, um, but it's not exclusively chlorophyll A. Um, though we are planning on bringing in the remotely sensed chlorophyll A to the map and present those alongside so that you can see uh, the abundance of cyanobacteria um, based off the CI cyano. And then you can also see, um, you know, growth at the surface of the water wave that has, um, um, that's detecting exclusively uh, chlorophyll. Great, that thanks, helps. Marissa. Thanks, Marissa. Yeah. Um, I think that's all we're going to do for today. Um, there's going to, there's another question though in the chat if you'd like to answer. Um, but I want to thank all of our presenters so much for presenting. And don't forget that you can continue the conversation on Twitter with hashtag 2022 IEP workshop. And uh, now I'm going to lead it back to Stephanie, who is going to close out our workshop. But thank you so much for joining and sticking around with us for this session. It was great to have everyone here. Stephanie, we can't hear you. Uh, uh, Stephanie had to step away for just a second. So we oh, probably okay. have a couple more minutes for uh, another Q&A if, if needed. Oh, OK, perfect. Um, okay. Marissa, are you still there? Yeah, I am. Go ahead. OK, all right. So uh, Stephen has a question that says, can you tell us more about predictive models you mentioned? Will they be have forecasting models? Yeah, that's good to bring up. So there's been discussion at some of the um, Delta groups and, and kind of um, work groups to um, evaluate, you know, bringing on um, a forecasting tool based off of satellite imagery and monitoring data in the Delta. So it's really at early stages, um, you know, to develop something specifically for the Delta. And at the statewide level, um, we're working to uh, you know, improve what we are presenting in our satellite imagery tool, you know, different types of data that's remotely sensed, um, make it more readily accessible to other entities to use it in their own visualizations and um, um, developing a quality assurance plan on, you know, how to better analyze the data as well. So once we get through those um, initial steps, we could move to, you know, evaluating um, how to bring on forecasting like um, it, that's done in a couple different places in the United States, but that's not on our um, short-term priorities or near-term horizon. Thanks for bringing that up. Well, thanks everyone for um, sticking it out until the very end. Thanks for hopefully those of you that have been with us all three days. Um, great participation on questions and all, all sorts of great talks. So. Hopefully you'll join us again next year for 2023, but I wanted to remind you all to go ahead and vote for your um, favorite early career poster and your favorite um, presentation. You can find the ballots for that on our IEP website. We're gonna try and get these um, recorded sessions posted on the YouTube channel soon. And um, if you'd like to help participate in next year's planning committee, please let us know either by contacting us on our um, IEP at wildlife.ca.gov email address, or you can let Christine or um, Steve Culberson know anytime bet between now and August, really. So thanks, you, thanks to everyone. Thanks to all the folks that have been helping behind the scenes. I hope you guys have a great time um, and a good weekend when you get to it. One more day.